For those of you that don't know me, my name's Justin. I'm uh, the executive pastor. And I just want to say welcome to all of you that are on our Mass Only Gathering and online. And for those of you in the room, glad that you're here. Um, So recently, my family moved. Um, As you can tell, we moved. We packed up all our stuff into boxes, into bags, and the like. And we moved um, because going from one kid to four kids in under four years uh, means that we needed more space. And what I've come to realize in the act of moving is that you really begin to unpack and discover what level of hoarder you are. <laughs> you, you, really, you really get a sense of it. You really start to understand. So I just think about, like, I think about my family and I think about the act of moving. And, and we did all kinds of crazy things that maybe you can relate to. We packed a literal bag of garbage from one house to the next because our garbage just couldn't stay in our other house. And so my wife, she's like, I'm not sure if they're picking up the garbage here or at our new place. And so I was like, this just seems so silly. This is literally a bag of trash. We're packing a bag of trash from one house to the next. And then, and then I was packing my nightstand, which my nightstand for me is the junk drawer in my life. Do you, have, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? That drawer that seems to be full of stuff, it's just all junk, and you, you, it, you don't need any of it, but you got to have it. So I packed my junk drawer, and, and what I discovered in this drawer was several broken watches. I don't know why you need any broken watches, let alone several broken watches, I had old watch bands that were worn out. I had a phone case for a phone I didn't have anymore. I had a box of cigars my brother gave me, and I don't smoke. I had lots of rock jewelry that my kids made me that honestly, they're not in here. I'm never going to wear. I'm not going to wear it. I'm not going to wear a necklace, like a rock necklace pendant. I'm just not going to do it. It's not stylish. I'm not going to do it. I had old birthday cards from years ago. And in fact, I found cards that I had intended to send and never did. And yet when it came to packing up this junk drawer, everything is like, oh, I need it. Packed it all in a box, labeled it nightstand, and I sent it to the other house. Brought all my bags with me. I need this stuff. It's like, it's just garbage. The thing is, we've been in the house over a month, and I haven't unpacked it yet. It's sitting in a box. In fact, on top of that, get this. When you move like a big dresser or drawers, sometimes people helping you move, which we had a bunch of people thankfully helping us move, they take the drawers out. And so I'm thinking, I don't want to t- them to take my underwear and sock drawer out. So I was like, no one's touching my underwear. That's so weird. So instead, what I did was I put it all in a suitcase. But as it turns out, I have so many pairs of underwear and socks that I have not unpacked that suitcase yet either. <laughs> I don't want to give you the impression that I wear the same pair of underwear all the time. That is not accurate. I'm just saying I packed it, and so I've got all these boxes on my side of our bedroom just unpacked. They're just sitting there not being touched. And I just asked, and I posit this question with you. At what point of not unpacking your stuff in a new house do you get to throw it away and admit, I don't need this? At what point? How long? (laughs) Maybe immediately. Six months? I'm not sure. I suspect if we ever move, we'll take it with us to the next place too. (laughs) The thing is, we can all bring things into our new homes that we don't need. We do it. We've done it. You can relate. And likewise, I think oftentimes, we bring clutter, we bring extra junk, we bring baggage into the church. Except it's not just like neutral and sits there on the side. This is baggage that creates pain, it creates problems, it creates division, it creates disunity for those in the church, and not only for those in the church, but for those who are looking for God, who are turning to God, and we're making it more difficult. This baggage can look like a lot of different things. I think for some of us, our baggage can look like And again, this is just some of it. Our baggage can look like our past. Maybe it's a past that you're ashamed of. Uh, Maybe it's feelings of disqualification. Maybe it's a sin or addiction that no matter how hard you try, you just can't kill it. You can't get over it. 
Maybe this part of your past, maybe it's the pain that you've caused people that you love in your life and there's broken relationships, you just don't know what to do with it. Maybe it's pain that's been inflicted on you in your past. Maybe it's pain that's been inflicted on you and what it means is that you hold people in your life now at arm's length so they don't hurt you again. Maybe your past isn't even something you're ashamed of. Maybe your past is something you're really impressed by. And it's impressive to you. And when you kind of compare yourself, it always forces that kind of past, that prideful past, always forces us to compare ourselves to other people. And when you do, you feel superior then. It might not even be something you're ashamed of. It might be something you're impressed with. But it's our past, and it creates baggage. And, and sometimes if it's pride, it, it prevents us from engaging with other people authentically. Um, sometimes it's not your past. Sometimes it's your prejudices. And we, we all have these to some extent. It's a pretty broad category. Are there certain, think about this, think about this. Are there certain personality types that grate you? that you're like, I just don't want to deal with people like that. Are there political views that people have that create anger, dislike, or even hatred towards certain people? Are there social or racial or cultural biases that you're aware of, or maybe you're not even aware of, but they're there? Are there unfair opinions that you have of the older generation if you're younger? And conversely, if you're older, that you have of the younger generation? See, we all have some kind of prejudices, some kind of biases to some extent. Maybe that's your baggage. Sometimes the baggage we have is all about preferences. Maybe that's your baggage. Maybe that's what you sense. And a lot of times, our preferences, they can come from other churches and maybe we were part of in the past. In fact, what's so ironic is sometimes our preferences come from churches that we, when we go to a new church, we're like, I want them to be like the old church that I no longer wish to go to, <laughs> which is hard to understand. Our preferences, this is how I like worship music, this is how I like preaching, this is how I like small groups done. I'd prefer it if we studied this less and this more. We could go on and on with a list of preferences. It's just something. It's not even scratching the surface. But we have pasts. We have prejudices. We have preferences. And this is some of the baggage. It's not all of it. Maybe something's on your list that's not in one of the bags up here. This is some of the baggage you can bring in. And why I'm so glad that you're here is because we're gonna continue our series, An Unexpected Journey, and what we're gonna look at is how the early church dealt with its spiritual baggage. Because every, everybody's got baggage, just a matter of what it is. And we're gonna see how the early church dealt with their spiritual baggage in relationships, and how Paul was instrumental in that process, since this is all about his life. And my heart, in our time together is that every one of us can leave our baggage at the foot of the cross by embracing three aspects of the gospel that are going to set us free. And if we will, these aspects, if we'll embrace them, they're going to create a different response to people in our life. And that's what I'm excited to talk about. So I'm going to set the context and we're going to jump right into our text today. Um, Here's what's happened up until this point. Last week in particular, we dealt with Paul's first missionary journey, um, which lasted a few years. And what's so neat about this is Paul, at this point, he's planting churches all over the Mediterranean basin. He's sharing the gospel as we talked, with courage, with conviction, with boldness, and he's seeing life transformation in a lot of lives of the Gentiles. And Gentiles is, that's a term for non-Jewish. So a lot of non-Jews have decided to follow Jesus and their lives are being transformed. There's cool stories. They're traveling from city to city doing this stuff. People are stepping into relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit's filling them and it's really neat. This is really cool. But the thing is, baggage creeps in to every church. It just does. And the early church was no different. And so Set in that context of what's going on, the story we're going to talk about happened about 15 to 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus, roughly. And it's going to be in Acts 15. 
And this whole story, this thing, this historical event, as it were, is called the Jerusalem Council. And I want to just kind of share the story with you and look at it together and what it means for us. So we're going to be in Acts 15.1. It'll be up here. Um, it'll be, actually, it'll just be up here as far as we are concerned. But you can use your phones, or your Bibles, whatever you'd like to use. And here it goes. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, I'm not going to really describe at all what circumcision is. You either know what it is or you don't. You can ask someone about it later. But the thing that's significant about what's going on here is what circumcision represented was a covenant between the nation of Israel, Abraham's descendants in the Old Testament, and God. And it was the sign of the covenant. And this was a really significant thing. It also created an obligation to keep the whole law. If you're going to do circumcision, then you've got to keep the whole Old Testament law. 600 plus commands about what you wear, what you eat, how you act. Is a long list. But on the table, when they're coming down, the, the big issue is, do you have to become Jewish before you can follow Jesus? Do you have to become a Jew before you can be saved? Is there anything else? And so this is what's going on. Certain people came in. Paul's planted all these churches, and people are coming in after Paul and saying, hey, Paul shared with you something about Jesus, the good news of Jesus, and that's true, but also there's circumcision, which is a big, that's, that's out of left field, you know? That's something, you know, it's like people all, people all over the Mediterranean basin are like, I don't know, I need to reconsider this whole Jesus thing if this is on the table. And so at this moment, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question, about this question, about this circumcision Old Testament law question. And this is a huge deal from Paul's perspective. And honestly, it should be a huge deal from our perspective too. It's pretty significant. Because the message that Paul had been communicating was through faith in Jesus, salvation by grace alone. That's it. There's no law. There's no circumcision. Nothing else is attached to it. It's just grace through faith in Jesus alone. That's the message. That's the message. That's what he's taken. The law of Moses was powerless to do what Jesus has the power to do and set people free. But now people are coming in. People are coming in and they're like, yeah, Jesus for sure. But there's also Jesus plus. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus the law. We got to add something else to the gospel. We've got to add something to the good news. There is a checkbox. It is dependent upon a work that you do to some extent. See, that's what they're adding. This is a big deal. And it's threatening to unravel all the missionary work, all the years of toil and effort that Paul's put into this life change, into these churches. And it's frustrating people and causing debate. So Paul and Barnabas, they go, and it says, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. The apostles and elders, they're the gatekeepers of the Jesus movement. They're the gatekeepers of the theology. We're talking the apostles that were eyewitnesses and walked with Jesus and the leaders in that church. They're, everybody else was dispersed in the persecution, but the apostles, they stayed put. And so now that's where the movement is centered in leadership. Right? So they go and report everything that God had been doing, also the conversations that are happening. And it's at this point, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. What? Do you hear the spiritual baggage there? It's spiritual baggage they're bringing with them. And the irony of this whole thing is not lost on me. Think about this. The Pharisees, that religious party, is the same party that murdered Jesus. And then they decided, well, he's the Messiah, and so they begin to follow him. And they've been accepted and allowed in. So how ironic is they're like, yeah, we were allowed in, but I don't know about these people. Right? It's ironic. It's almost hypocritical. It's tough. It's what baggage does. And everybody's got it. 
So the apostles and elders, they met to consider this question. And so much is hanging on this question. So much is, should the Gentiles be allowed into the church? And unless you are Jewish today, that's you. Should the outsider be allowed in? Do they have to become Jewish first? And if so, for how long? Should anything be attached to the gospel? This is the question at the heart of it. If they cave, and get this, if they cave on circumcision, they say, okay, just this one thing. Just this one thing. What else? What's next? How many more? How many checkboxes do you add? That legalism is a really slippery slope. When are you done? What's next? If this, then that. And if that, then this. How far do you go? So they met to consider this question, and after much discussion, Peter got up and he addressed them. And Peter got up, and this is, and again, when I look at this, my opinion is I don't think Peter's on the fence about this situation at all. But he's a good leader, and so he allows there to be discussion. He fosters some opinions that are different than his, just so he has buy in, just so the Holy Spirit can work. I believe he's a good leader. But after much discussion, the apostle Peter got up and he addressed them, and he says this Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. And this is like, you're like, wait, what? Exactly, like, some time ago, God made a choice from, and that, some time ago, some time ago, what's he talking about? What Peter is talking about is an experience he had. This is kind of like a story within a story, almost. Like, Inception, okay? Think about that. It's a story within a story, this is a story within a story, and what Peter is doing in this moment is he's flashing back to a moment from about five to ten years before where Peter had seen a vision and God had created a faith-shaping experience. So he's saying, some time ago, I had this experience that the, that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, would hear the good news of Jesus from my lips and believe. And here's the situation he's talking about. Let me take you into that story for a moment. Um, this is what Peter saw. He had a vision of a sheet being lowered down from heaven with all these unclean, impure, according to Jewish law, animals. And then he heard the voice of the Lord in this vision, and it said this, get up, Peter, kill and eat. That'd be a super creepy thing to hear in a vision, okay? Get up, kill and eat, right? You know, like, I, I'm not saying that's what it sounded like. It'd just be creepy. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter responded, with no way. And he says this, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And he, this vision is repeated a few times and the voice spoke to him a second time and said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this vision is repeated a few times for effect so Peter gets it, that it wasn't random. <laughs> Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And here's the kicker and the big hint. This isn't about food at all. It's about people. It's about people. Because not long, not long after that in the story, and if you want to look at this, this is in like Acts 10 and the first part of Acts 11. Not long after that, the servants of a Roman centurion named Cornelius, the, the servants go to Peter's house and they're like, hey, Cornelius, he's a, he's, a, he's a Roman centurion, he's a well-known guy in the community, he sent us to bring you to his house. Peter, will you go? Peter, because he had this vision, he's like, yes, I'll go with you. So he goes and he gets there and Cornelius is there waiting to hear whatever Peter has to tell him. And not only just, not only just Cornelius, but all these servants, all of his family, everybody he knows is gathered in this one place. And Peter gives about the most awkward introduction one human can to another. This is what he says. You are well aware that is it against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Say that the next time you show up to a dinner party, you know. <laughs> the implication that Peter is copping to is that up until this point, I considered you impure and unclean. My whole life. It's tough. It's tough. This is 10 to 15 years after the resurrection this moment happens. This is... This is Peter who looked into the empty tomb and didn't see Jesus. This is Peter who had breakfast on the beach with Jesus. And this has been his opinion that whole time. I mean, it's, it's baggage for sure. It's baggage that gets brought in. And this may be really awkward by our context, but I also kind of see Peter just take the awkwardness out of it and remember that this was a couple thousand years ago. And so I think Peter's just being really direct, really blunt. He's acknowledging the elephant in the room. 
hey, this is a well-known issue. We don't talk. We're, we're divided here, you guys. Up until this point, I wouldn't even have a meal with you. But Peter to his credit, he obeys and he shares the gospel. The good news of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection and how forgiveness is in the name of Jesus by faith only, and that's the only thing that forgives sins. And when Cornelius and his household hear it, they start praising God, and then the Holy Spirit fills them, and Peter's like, well, if they're filled with the Holy Spirit just like we are, he makes sure they get baptized. It's cool. And at that point, the divide between Gentile and Jew, this is, like the, this is a big incursion. This is, the wall is coming down. So when Peter says some time ago, they heard from my lips, this is the moment he's thinking of. This is the story. This is what, this is what the experience, and it was well known to people in his life. So it's that some time ago story, which is here, when we flash back to the, the story for a moment, the present story we're in, In Acts 15, where Peter says this with confidence, they heard from my lips, and God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. And let me tell you, in this, I see a huge aspect of the gospel. And the first one we're going to talk about today, the gospel is for everyone. It's for everyone. There is no barrier. It is the only hope for everyone. It was central to both Jews and Gentiles. It cut across everything. God made a way for for a relationship with him to be available to all through his son, Jesus, and it is for everyone. It is for everyone. And get this, how empowering is this reality for women? Because the sign of God's covenant was circumcision, so that excluded a gender. And the gospel, when that, when that is taken off the table, oh my goodness, this is so empowering to women then. And it is today. It cuts across every barrier, every line. No matter how overt or nuanced. If we will embrace this reality, then I'll just tell you, I believe our response has to be to abandon our prejudices, whatever they may be. No one is too far from God. The gospel is for everyone. Peter pressed in. He associated with. He ate a meal with. He let go of his preconceived judgments and his baggage and his history, even though he was uncomfortable. And here's the thing. I'm going to invite you to abandon your prejudices because if your fellowship, the fellowship community that you're in, if it at some point, at some way, doesn't at least make you a little bit uncomfortable, it may be because you're only hanging out with people who are just like you. But the gospel's for everyone. It's beautiful. Abandon your prejudices because the gospel is for everyone. And if we'll do that, then we'll be able to leave our baggage at the foot of the cross. Leave your baggage at the foot of the cross. Leave it at the foot of the cross and walk away free. And Peter continues on. And here's what, as he continues on, he's talking to this group of people and there's so much division, but he's so incredibly gentle. Hear what he says and hear the heart of a gentle pastor who loves the people he's talking to. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? It's a yoke. It's heavy. Do you hear the heart for Gentiles who are far from God? Do you hear a heart for them? Like, why? We haven't been able to, why would we put this on them? Oh, the poor Gentiles, why would we do this to them? Why would we heap on them law after law after law and not the love of God? But do you also hear a heart for his Jewish brothers and sisters? Guys, aren't you exhausted from trying to keep a whole law and you haven't been able to do it? And neither of your kids, and neither of your kids, 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 no one's been able to do it. Aren't you tired yet? And I can only imagine him saying this to the crowd gathered that day. And those Pharisees in that group, that's the same religious party that murdered Jesus. Here they are following him. You got to imagine they got so much spiritual baggage, right? They've got thoughts of a pride, prideful past, right? Maybe some morality. Um, they know some laws that other people don't. But at the same time, they got to be racked with some guilt and shame because they missed Jesus and they killed him. 
That's, such, that's so much baggage. It's like pride and shame. Pride and shame, that's so tough. And that's where they're, and that, so that's why I think Peter speaks what he speaks. He says, as he continues, he says, no, we're not gonna put that yoke on them. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. And it's an amazing statement of faith for a couple of reasons. It speaks of grace first and foremost. But then, get this, that we are saved just as they are. That we are saved just as they are. This is such a statement of humility because it elevates the Gentiles. It doesn't say, oh, you know, they're saved just as we are. We went first and then they're, no, it's just saying we're saved just the same way they are. He levels the playing field at so much humility. And in this, I believe we see the second aspect of the gospel. The gospel is for everyone, but the gospel is the great equalizer. It's the great equalizer. This is so neat. And something I, the older I get, the more I'm starting to understand If you are ashamed of your past, the good news of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins through him alone with his death on the cross, the gospel, if you're ashamed of your past, that gospel, the gospel, it elevates you as a new creation. You aren't your past anymore. You aren't what you've done. You aren't the mistakes you've made. It absolutely elevates you. But if you're so proud of who you were, The gospel also reminds you that everybody is a sinner, only forgiven by Jesus, and it levels the playing field. What other power in all the world can equalize people like that? It is the great equalizer, and it's so powerful. And what this does, this aspect, this truth, it robs your past of all its power. And if you are willing to embrace this, then you have the power to surrender your past to Jesus. Surrender your past to Jesus. If your past is a source of pride for you, today may be the day that you embrace the humility through the cross. Let go, cling to Jesus, rest in him. Let go of the pressure to have to measure up ever. And if you think that no one could ever love you because of your past, because of the things that you've done, if you don't think that you're lovable or that there's something you can't be forgiven, I'll tell you that may be a plus moment, a Jesus plus moment. If if you feel God can never love you because of your past, do you believe what God said to Peter? Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. If this is God's opinion of you, if you're thinking you can't be loved, why won't you believe this about yourself? Why won't you believe what God says of you? The Apostle Paul spoke to people that struggled just like you do when he wrote, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. And get this, behold, the new has come. And I love that. And our discipleship group, we were looking at this first. And one of, the, one of the guys in my group pointed out, he's like, behold, it's like, oh, look at it. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. That's what Paul's saying. He's like, oh, look at you. How marvelous you are. How wonderful you are. How amazing you are. You're, oh, you're new. That's the opinion that God has of you. Will you finally let go of that baggage And surrender your past to Jesus because the gospel is the great equalizer. And if you will do that today, I believe you will have the power to leave your baggage at the foot of the cross. Surrender your past. Let it go. Whether you're proud about it or whether you're ashamed of it, it, let its power go. Leave it at the cross. You came into church today, leave it here or walk away free. And it's at this moment in the conversation, all those years ago, that Paul steps into the conversation briefly, even though he started it. He steps in briefly here. And the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. They're all listening about what God had done. And when they finished, James spoke up. And this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who's now who went from not believing his brother was the Messiah to all of a sudden giving his life and leading the church in Jerusalem where they killed his half-brother. James speaks up and he says, Brothers, listen to me. Simon, that's another name for Peter, 
has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. And then he quotes the Old Testament prophecies. And this is what it says, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, says the Lord who does these things. In other words, this, James is so smart. Such a wise decision. He quotes their Old Testament scriptures and prophets back to them to say, don't you guys understand? Our own scriptures affirm this was God's plan from the beginning. Everything that's happening now is in line with what we read. He hinges it. It's not about Paul's experience. It's not about Peter's experience. Everything they're experiencing is being connected to the authority of scripture. Really wise move. Good move, James. Right? There's so much wisdom in that move. And this is what James says. Given that, this has been God's plan all along. That's what we're seeing. He says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. That's powerful. How do we make it? And think about this. This is Gentiles and Jews, and I know maybe that divide doesn't exist here now. But how do we make it as a church as a community, how do we make it unnecessarily difficult for people to turn into God? By the baggage we bring with us, by the baggage that we carry in ourselves and then we sit down and we expect other people to carry and walk in with as well. How do we make it unnecessarily difficult? And I'm telling you, now is the moment, now is the day, today is the day to leave your baggage at the foot of the cross so that we don't make it harder for the people that God is drawing and calling to himself. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to love that way? So that was James' judgment. He steps up and kind of makes the call. And then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were among the believers. And with them, they sent the following letter. And this letter is gonna communicate what they wanna communicate. They sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, and I love this, your brothers. The apostles and elders, and we are your brothers. What unity and love in that greeting. To the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. I love it. Greetings. (laughs) Hey, guys, you know. Since we have heard that someone out from went out from us without our authorization. Now we understand. It's not like the church in Jerusalem sent all these people out. They just went out without authorization on their own and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why endurance matters. You get sent when endurance matters. And therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, get this, not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. We're not gonna burden you with anything but the following requirements and we think they're for your good. What are they? What are the following requirements? Because on the table is circumcision, which is a big deal, and 600 plus Jewish laws. What are the following requirements? You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. And then I like this, farewell. (laughs) That's how you end your letter, you know? Farewell, period. Not even an exclamation point. Man. They took the whole, like, they took circumcision and the whole Jewish law and they took it down to four things. Four things. See, this is, this is insane. This is intense. But this is the important moment that they're holding an, an aspect, a component of the gospel. And it's this, that the gospel's all you need. The gospel's for everyone. The gospel's the great equalizer. And the gospel is all you need. That's it. A relationship with God through faith in Jesus is all of it. It's all of it. That's it. It's all you need. It's all you need. That's what they're affirming. And you may say, why those four things? All right, didn't they just replace 600 with four? I don't think so, not necessarily. Consider it. What they're proposing are wise safeguards to protect people and to protect people in the church because they love people. Sexual immorality. Here's what Paul writes about it. Flee from sexual immorality. That's pretty pretty direct. Run away. Flee. 
He goes on, he says, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He's just saying sexual immorality is unlike having any other sin. It has unique consequences, unique devastation. It's unlike anything else. And it's harmful not only to others, but to yourself. This is, this is spoken for people's benefit. This isn't just a weight around their neck. It's for people. And the other, the other commands, right? Because there's only four. They took the whole Old Testament law and made it into four. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols from blood from the meat of strangled animals. These food guidelines sound very weird. And sure, there is some health benefit to abstaining from these. But I want you to consider another perspective that when, when I saw it from this perspective, I thought it was really neat. Do you, do you see what's kind of going on here? The Jewish community, to bring in these Gentiles, they are laying down preferences. Our preference is that you would keep the whole law and be circumcised, but that's our preference, and the gospel's all you need. So they lay that down. They're laying down their preferences. So when this this community is basically saying, Gentiles, the the, the Jews have already laid down their preferences for you. Will you lay down your your food preferences? Sure, yes, you could do this stuff, but we're saying, will you lay down your preferences, Gentiles, for the sake of your struggling and obstacle-ridden Jewish brothers and sisters? Will you do that? Will you love them enough to do that? What a cool picture of unity. The Jewish community, the Jewish Christians are abandoning their preferences and laying down their preferences, and they're asking the Gentiles, will you love us enough to lay down some of yours? You're free. Yeah, you're free. Would you do this for us because you love us? What a cool picture of unity. Because what the early church understood is because the gospel is all you need, then let's be synced up on that. Let's be uncompromising in that. Let's be foundational in that. But let's be free and empowered to lay down the rest of our preferences out of love. To lay down our preferences. Look at what Paul says. Look at what Paul says. And it's like, Paul says this to a church. He says, though I am free, and belong to no one. I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. That is a heart that lays down preferences and he says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel. I lay down all my preferences, everything I wanna hold on to. The gospel is all I need, so I'll lay down all my preferences if it means I might reach people I'm not reaching. And I'm just saying this, if we can lay down our preferences like that as a church, then we will reach people nobody else is reaching in our community because we are doing things and loving sacrificially like no one else is doing things and loving sacrificially. But will you lay down your preferences? Will you lay down your preferences? Will you leave whatever baggage remains at the foot of the cross and walk away free? Will you leave your baggage there? That's what's on the table today. Leave it here. Walk away free. So the men were sent off with this letter. And they went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. And the people read it and were glad for its encouraging message probably because they didn't have to be circumcised. But probably, but probably more likely because a Jesus-only faith means freedom. It's freeing. You can rest in it. If we'll embrace these three aspects of the gospel, that it's for everyone, that the gospel is the great equalizer and the gospel is all you need, then we'll be a church that deals with our baggage. We'll be willing to deal with our baggage and we'll leave it at the foot of the cross because at the foot of the cross is a landfill for it. And we can leave it there. And it means that we will abandon our prejudices. We will surrender our pasts and we will lay down our preferences. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you walked in. I don't know what you're willing to let go of today but are you at least willing to admit that you have baggage that you don't need? Are you willing to admit you have baggage you don't need? Aren't you exhausted from carrying everything you are carrying? But I wanna be the one to tell you, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do that today. 
leave your baggage at the foot of the cross and walk away free as you live out your faith on an unexpected journey. Let's pray together this morning. Father, only you know what our next steps are. Only you know what our baggage is. Whatever it is that we need to lay down, whatever it is we need to be free from, I pray that you would do it today. You would show us and reveal in us what it is. You would give us um, the awareness and the ability. Help us to encounter your love so intense that we'd be willing to lay down all these other things for the sake of people. Whether it's freedom from our past, from our prejudices and our biases, or whether we're holding on to a whole lot of preferences. Help us just come face to face with you in this moment and respond in whatever way you reveal. Thank you for your love. And Jesus, it's in your name we pray these things together. Amen.